back in again. Clark down the left wing. Clark in front of the net. Felino scores! Michael Felino! To Gilmore. Gilmore to Bobby Rose! Shot! Scores! Nikolai from David Lowry. A long pass. Gilmore break away! Shoot! Scores! Sportsline's Maple Leaf Special. It's all right now. It's All Right Now is brought to you by Molson Canadian, what beer is all about. And in part by General Motors of Canada. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Taddy. And I'm Mark Hepshire. It's been a rough ride for Leaf fans, players, and management. The rough ride is done. A great playoff run last year and a great start this year have all of us thinking it is all right now. In the next 60 minutes, we'll examine why. Stay with us. In Canada, parties are planned to suit the season. Witness the fall party. The winter party. The spring party. And the ever-popular summer party. The seasonal party where you'll find the clean, crisp taste of Molson Canadian. And what beer's all about. While every car maker offers protection to help people survive accidents, one company asked, what could be safer than not having an accident at all? Recently, they developed a new anti-lock brake, specially designed to cost less. So this year, anti-lock brakes aren't just for expensive cars, because this year, they're standard equipment on 95% of the cars they make. The company is General Motors. Welcome back. There's no better way to follow up a good playoff run than with a record-breaking start. The Leafs surprised all by leaping out of the gate this season and entering the record books. That 10-0 start has certainly set the tone. Bill Bird recaps it for us now. The Leafs provided plenty of fireworks for their fans early on. Dave Andrichuk getting things started on the right foot, scoring the team's first two goals of the season in a 6-3 win over Dallas. It's a good start for everybody. I mean, uh, we all played well tonight, and that's why we won the game. After Wendell Clark had potted the game winner against Chicago, the Leafs took their show on the road in Philadelphia and appeared headed for overtime when Rob Pearson set up John Cullen for the decisive score and a third straight Toronto victory. A blowout over Washington kept the streak going, and it was obvious ex-Leaf ally Afraidy wasn't too happy, but it allowed the Leafs to rest one of their stars. I sure showed Gilmore I didn't play him in the last seven minutes, making all that money. <laughs> but the levity changed in the next game. Leafs outshot by Detroit 43-22, only to escape with a 6-3 win over the struggling Red Wings. We did not play well. Uh, there's, no, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you know, we're, we're in a mold right now. We're winning. Everything's going our way. But sooner or later, it's going to catch up to us. But not in the next night's rematch, as John Cullen provided the winner in a 2-1 decision. Even with Toronto's perfect start, the Leafs were being overshadowed for the time being by the Blue Jays. A point not lost on our Jim Ralph. Well, Jimmer, as you can see, it has finally stopped raining. The tarp is actually off the... We're at Maple Leaf Gardens, stupid Maple Leaf Gardens. Uh, yes, Guy. Well, when the World Series is finally over, the Leafs should get the recognition they deserve. And that's exactly what happened. A 7-2 blitz of the Hartford Whalers equaled the team's fastest start, six straight wins. On to Southern Florida, and the Leafs' first ever trip to the Miami Arena resulted in overtime before Rob Pearson knocked in the game winner to tie the NHL record for most wins at the start of a season with eight. Two nights later in Tampa Bay, Pearson was decked and sustained a partially torn knee ligament. He'd be gone for more than four weeks. Earlier, the Leafs had also lost Peter Zezel with a back injury. Still no word on his return. But the Leafs flying Tampa 2-0, their ninth straight win, a new record. To keep it going, the Leafs needed to win in Chicago, where they hadn't had a victory in almost four years, dating back to December of 89. But success came on the 13th try, a 4-2 win, as the Leafs set a new mark, 10 straight wins to start the season. It's hard to believe that up until two and a half years ago, the Maple Leafs were like a rudderless ship. Instead of moving ahead, they seemed to forever be going in circles. That all changed when Cliff Fletcher took over as president and general manager. And as Sportsline's Jim Ralph tells us, success begins at the top, and that's just where Fletcher's Leafs are headed. Maple Leaf Gardens may not be the house that Cliff built, but Cliff Fletcher may go down as one of the greatest renovators in the history of pro sports. Fletcher was announced as a Maple Leafs new general manager and CEO on June 4, 1991. 
but few could imagine he could turn a floundering franchise into a legitimate Stanley Cup contender in such a short period of time, even though Fletcher said he knew what needed to be done when he came to the Leafs. In order to get the type of job done that has to be done so that all Torontonians and hockey fans and shareholders can be proud, then the person at the top has to have the flexibility to formulate policy and make the decisions necessary that have to be made. Fletcher's first move was to bring some pride back to the organization. On August 8th, it was announced that Wendell Clark would be the new Leafs captain, and former Leaf Darrell Sittler would return to the fold as a special assistant to the president. In September of 91, Fletcher pulled off the first of what proved to be a series of big trades, as he acquired Grant Fear from the Edmonton Oilers, along with Glenn Anderson and Craig Berube, in exchange for Vince Damfus, Peter Ring, Luke Richardson, and minor leaguer Scott Thornton. I think that in acquiring Grant Fuhrer, we have someone who can be the cornerstone of the foundation. Anytime you have a goaler like Grant Fuhrer in a game, you have a chance to win the game. Although the trade seemed to improve the Leafs, it was evident they still had a long way to go. And on January 2nd, Fletcher engineered a huge 10-player deal with his former team, the Calgary Flames, that would make Doug Gilmore, who had left the Flames the day before, a Toronto Maple Leaf. I just don't believe that I was respected here. Um, I think every player wants to be needed and wants to be respected for what they can do on the ice. And I just don't think that was uh, true. Now I'm going with a man like Cliff Fletcher again. And he brought me here to start with, and uh, he's taking me on to Toronto now, so I owe him. Also coming to the Leafs were defenseman Jamie McCowan and Rick Natras, forward Kent Manderville and veteran goalie Rick Walmsley. While the Leafs gave up Gary Lehman, Michel Petit, Alexander Godinyuk, Craig Berube, and goalie Jeff Reese. The trade showed a huge improvement on the ice for the Leafs as they finished being one of the top teams from the All-Star break until the end of the regular season. Before the trade deadline, the Leafs also picked up Dave McIlwain, Ken Baumgartner, and Mark Osborne in what looked to be minor deals at the time. And although the Leafs finally appeared to be coming together as a team, they missed the playoffs, finishing three points back of Minnesota. On May 29, 1992, Fletcher added a huge piece to the Leaf puzzle as he managed to get Pat Burns away from the Montreal Canadiens and bring a proven winning coach to the organization. Pat Burns' teams play hard, shift in, shift out, and when you have a club like we have who have to really learn how to win and uh, to play hard uh, every, every time they step out there on the ice, I think uh, he's the right man for the job at the right time. I think that uh, uh, what's important is, is to win hockey games, and my record shows it. I think that uh, uh, the team has never finished below 90 points in the four years I was there, and I think that's what the people want here is, is a winning team, and that's what I'm here to give them. Burns delivered on his promise as the Leafs got off to a solid start last season and even resembled the new team as they showed their new look uniforms, all part of an effort to recapture the pride in the blue and white jersey. In November, Fletcher gave up just a draft pick to get John Cullen for the Hartford Whalers, giving the Leafs more depth at center. Two weeks later, he picked up Bill Berg on waivers from the New York Islanders. In January, the key to the next big deal may have been the play of rookie goalie Felix Potvin. Back up from the minors to replace the injured Grant Fuhrer, Potvin gave up just five goals in five games and instilled enough confidence in Cliff Fletcher to make Fuhrer available to Buffalo for goalie Darren Pupa and a much-needed scoring winger in Dave Andrichuk, who proved to be the final ingredient for the Leafs to go from pretenders to contenders. We're able to obtain some scoring. And, and Dave Anderchuk, he's a proven scorer. He can play left wing. He's a solid player. And uh, getting a first-round pick in, in a draft that uh, may be the best in a decade, I think, is very important for the future of the Leafs. I guess after 300 rumors, the, the 301 finally came true. And, uh, you know, it's tough, but it, uh, that's the business. So while Cliff Fletcher may not have been the actual architect of Maple Leaf Gardens, in just two and a half years, he certainly made it a lot better place to visit. I'm Jim Ralph for Sportsline. Still to come more in the building of the Leafs, a conversation with Cliff Fletcher. Stay with us. Poorly fitted insulation leaves gaps in here. 
which can be even worse back here. These gaps reduce our value of the insulation by up to 35%. Flexibat is made to fit perfectly. The exclusive flexible edge compresses, then expands for a better fit. In here and back here. See? No gaps. New Flexibat. Full R value. The better insulation. Not long ago, they learned about the review. They knew six other plants were after the assignment. They understood that to compete would require not just building a new product, but also setting a new standard for quality. Most of all, they believed in themselves. And today, Canadians build these cars for the entire world. The company is General Motors. It's amazing all the different beers there are these days. Lights, drafts, cold filtered, dries. Trends. Yeah, people try them, and they usually come back. Yeah, they come back. There's a lot to be said for a distinctive full flavored beer, and there's one Molson Ale that says it all. Imagine our world through a child's eyes. Hopeful. Each moment a memory. Every day a discovery. Last year, Pharma Plus and our customers donated mittens to over 100,000 children who could not afford them. This year, we'll do it again. Find out how you can share the feeling of warm hands, warm heart at Pharma Plus Drug Mart. Together, we'll help every child discover the plus. Welcome back to Sportsline. No matter what the sport, trades can make or break a team. Pulling the trigger on a big trade isn't as easy as it looks sometimes. It may take weeks, even months, before a big deal is consummated. Cliff Fletcher knows all about pulling off the blockbuster trade. He engineered the biggest swap in NHL history in January of 92 that helped turn the Leafs into a contender. Jim Taddy talked with Cliff about that and other deals. One of the bigger dates is the day that uh, you acquired Doug Gilmore, and it's actually the second time you're acquiring him. Of course, he's a, a very important part of what the Maple Leafs do these days. So take us back as to how that, that trade happened. Did, did it sort of come out of the blue, or did you pursue him for quite some time? Well, we had talked about Doug uh, on a couple of occasions, uh, going right back to the summer when I took over, but uh, not very seriously. And uh, it was actually his... Uh, contract negotiations and the arbitration decision that uh, I guess triggered Doug to walk out on the uh, uh, on the flames on New Year's Day and uh, uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to make a deal uh, two days later. Okay, he's obviously been a big part of things this uh, I guess would be no surprise to you because you had him in Calgary but did you envision he could do as much as he has done? Well you know Doug's uh, had a great career and uh, uh, unfortunately for him and very fortunate for the Leafs is this is the first major market that he's ever played in, so it's the first time he's getting uh, the attention that he really deserves. Uh, St. Louis is not a major media market, and certainly Calgary wasn't. Uh, in St. Louis, he had a 105-point year, uh, led the Blues, and in Calgary, the year we won the Stanley Cup in 89, uh, he was by far our best forward uh, throughout the season and the Stanley Cup playoffs. So. Uh, uh, you know, we knew he was a quality hockey player, and uh, I guess uh, fans here and back in Eastern Canada only started to realize it uh, after he donned the Maple Leaf uniform. The difference, though, between Calgary and Toronto, as far as Doug's concerned, and in Calgary when he was there, he there was a strong supporting cast. There was another five what I call Grade A hockey players, and uh, when Doug came here, he was alone in that category, and. We needed him to do everything, and uh, he's more than done that for us. Uh, certainly the icing on the cake as far as the trades goes, the, the acquisition of Dave Andrichuk. Was this a, a long, drawn-out thing, or did it just sort of come out of the woodwork? Well, we've been talking to Buffalo for uh, uh, two or three months. Uh, I think from our perspective, what uh, uh, triggered us to want to do it was the fact that we knew in June we were going to lose one of our two goaltenders in the expansion draft. So, uh, and we also made the decision that we felt doing it sooner rather than later would, uh, uh, would be of greater benefit to our team. In other words, we could get more in return. Um, 
uh, it was a good uh, fit with Buffalo. Uh, they were looking for a goaler like Grant, and he did the job there. They won the first round of the playoffs for the first time in six or seven years. And Anderchuk fit in uh, hand and glove with Doug Gilmore and uh, was really productive right off the bat. But it was, uh, uh, realistically, it was the threat of the expansion draft that made it easier for us to make the deal because regardless of how good we thought Felix Pogman would be, you never know how a young goaler is going to react when his security blanket leaves. And in Pogman's case, the security blanket was Grant Fuhrer, one of the best goalers in the NHL. And certainly you couldn't have predicted, although you may have wished, the, uh, the, how Dave Andrzejczyk has produced since he's come here. Well, uh, you know, uh, Dave was at the stage of his career where a change was really good for him. He'd spent his entire career up until the trade uh, with the Sabres and, uh, you know, seemed to be uh, uh, the person that had to take the, the rap for whatever lack of team success they had from time to time. And uh, coming to Toronto, it was a brush of fresh air for him, a new start, and he's just in the prime uh, uh, years of his career, so uh, he's been a big asset for us. When you look back, uh, also, uh, the signing of Pat Burns has to be a, a major coup for this team. Were you at all surprised that, in fact, he was available? Well, when, uh, when I was first surprised at the fact he might be available, uh, I didn't believe it. Uh, you know, he'd had... Uh, he never had a season under 90 points with Montreal, and uh, his first year there had gone to the Stanley Cup Finals against uh, the Flames. Um, uh, I recognized him, uh, as he is throughout the league, as uh, one of the premier coaches in the league, and we're, uh, that's probably, uh, of all the moves that we made, the key move, because uh, he brought instant uh, credibility to uh, the Maple Leaf Hockey Club, and... Uh, uh, you know, when Pat steps out there on the ice to run a practice, the players pay attention, and that's where it all starts. You've certainly uh, been around hockey long enough to, to understand what the challenge uh, here was. Uh, when you compare this to uh, when you stepped into Atlanta, were there any similarities there? I mean, there's a team that starts from nothing. Here's a team that had been there and really was down near the bottom. Well, in a lot of respects, it's almost easier to start an expansion team, uh, not as much as expected of... Uh, immediately and uh, you can start and uh, build up one block at a time and uh, develop uh, the type of team you're, you're striving to uh, when you take over an existing team well uh, there are more restrictions but realistically when we took over this team uh, there were some pretty capable national hockey league players here and a couple young draftees in the wing like felix potter you could talk about uh, the success on the ice, that's well documented, but the building of the organization had to take a lot of time. Uh, was it a little more difficult than you may have thought? Well, the one thing I felt that uh, the Leafs for a number of years had been uh, strongly lacking is in the area of charitable community and corporate relations. Uh, just their overall image out in the community, and uh, that was the easiest part of it, to go out and bring in good people like Daryl Sittler and Bill Waters and... Uh, uh, and just focus uh, far more attention on uh, our community relations. Uh, when you assess it, uh, just over two years, are you, are you, is this like the end of the road for it? Or is the job done there, or do you have to continue on? Oh, well, the job's really just started. There are so many things. We haven't won anything yet. Uh, we had a lot of fun last year, created some excitement, uh, got within a whisker of the Stanley Cup Finals, but... Uh, the ultimate goal is to hang another banner up there in, uh, in the gardens uh, uh, depicting our most recent Stanley Cup championship. And uh, uh, there's a difficult road ahead to achieve that, but uh, that's what our goal is. You've been there before, so you know how tough it is to get those final pieces, whatever it takes to, to get into that championship form. A great season last year, a great start, but uh, you're in the position now where maybe some of the older players uh, can't contribute the way they did last year, the, the way you may want them. How difficult is that process to sort of figure out when a guy is no longer uh, capable of doing what you want him to do? Well, you, you know, uh, basically the coach is responsible for the present and the manager for the future. Uh, uh, I think our veteran players uh, uh, will perform well once we get down the home stretch and into the playoffs. But I think the biggest job we've done over the last couple of years, very quietly, and uh, uh, it hasn't surfaced yet, and that is shoring up the foundation. We've had 
four first round draft picks in the last two years. Our scouting staff under Pierre Dorian's uh, uh, leadership is doing a tremendous job and Anders Hedberg over in Europe. And uh, we're, we're very quietly but surely uh, building up a reservoir of young players that are going to ensure that the Leafs are going to be a competitive team on a year-to-year -year basis. You can't always win the Stanley Cup, but uh, like the Boston Bruins, if, if you have the organization, you can always be competitive, and you never know when that real chance to win is going to, uh, going to happen. Uh, but we have some young players that are going to be able to fill in when, the veteran, uh, when it's the veteran's time to leave. You go back to last spring, certainly a great feeling. Obviously, you wanted to go in the next step and play Montreal, but how important is it in a building process to have that immediate success? Well, I think it was extremely important that we did well in the first round of the playoffs last year after, uh, you know, finishing uh, the way we did, uh, 99 points in the top eight. Uh, when you're in the top third of the league, uh, you're a pretty good hockey club, but... Coming home in that plane, I remember after the first two losses in Detroit, uh, I was saying, boy, we just got to get it back together. And it was remarkable the way the team came through. But winning that first round of the playoffs against Detroit, a team that probably, if they got by us, could have won the Stanley Cup, uh, was a tremendous achievement and very important in the development uh, uh, of our club as a team. We remember the shot well of uh, you celebrating when the, the final goal goes in by Boryshevsky. Do you, you think back to that often? Oh, I think about it very often. That, uh, when my career's over in hockey management, that'll be one of my finest memories. Still to come, a feature on the Leafs, Big Shooters. Stay with us. Welcome back. It's funny how things work out. When I first asked Don Martin to do a story on Clark Gilmore and Andrew Chuck, they weren't on the same line. They are now, and like everything else, it's worked out very well. They are very excited. The tip-off should have come on opening night at Maple Leaf Gardens. If there was ever any doubt the Leafs would pick up where they left off, it was a race with the very first goal of the season. Gilmore looking in front. Now there's something you don't see every night. In fact, you'll probably see a goal like that only another 40 or 50 times this season. Because what Doug Gilmore has been to the Leafs, Dave Andrichuk has been to Doug Gilmore. Rescued from the doghouse in Buffalo, Andrichuk's career was given new life in Toronto. You get new life, especially when you get a chance to play. And, uh, you know, uh, coming over from Buffalo, I was there quite a while, so uh, you, uh, uh, you kind of seem to get comfortable over there. And, and I came here, I got a little bit of new life. And, uh, and things have really worked out well for me. The numbers don't lie. Since Andrew Chuck joined the Leafs, Toronto has lost only 11 of 53 regular season games. Andrew Chuck has scored 42 goals in that span. And now that Wendell Clark has joined up for the last dozen games or so after the injury to Nick Borshevsky, the Leafs' top line is among the most dangerous in the NHL, accounting for almost half the team's offense. In terms of talent, he'd be the best two guys I've played with. And Dougie Gilmore, probably one of the best center icemen in the league. And Davey Andertruck, uh, one of the best wingers in the league. He's, uh, you know, he's scored 35 to 40, 50 goals now every season since he's been in the league. So there, I don't think uh, there, there's probably only two, three guys in the league that have scored more goals on an every-year basis than Davey has. So um, as far as talent on the line goes, uh, I just try to <laughs> follow those guys around. The captain has enjoyed a rebirth of his own since last season's opening playoff games in Detroit when he was written off in some quarters. The Leafs could have done the same thing much earlier in his career when chronic back and knee trouble kept him out of the lineup for months at a time. Now that Wendell is healthy again and leading the league in goal scoring, it shows the Leafs' loyalty to him was well placed. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, still here after nine years. There's been a lot of uh, changes, a lot of things have have changed in the nine years that I've been here, and I'm, you know, I'm just very happy that I could be a part of it when the team is turning around, uh, and and that is the loyalty that the team has had towards me, and I'm very uh, grateful for that because I've never wanted to leave, and I've always wanted to stay here and play. It's great for him. It's something that uh, he's wanted to achieve. He's wanted to do it uh, inside, but the outside and the physical abuse that he's taken over the last few years have uh, have stopped him from doing that, and it's nice to see that uh, he's Wendell Clark again. Of course, before Gilmore arrived, Wendell was the main man, the number one draft choice in 1985 and easily the most popular player on the team. 
but there has never been any hint of hostility over sharing the limelight. After all, Clark resenting Gilmore would be like a drowning man resenting a life raft. The, the credit he gets, he deserves because he's as, as talented as he is, and we're just players trying to play and uh, mold around Dougie to, to make a hockey team win. And besides, there is something even Gilmore can't take away from Wendell, that legendary wrist shot. Growing up in Kelvington, Saskatchewan, Wendell's father, Les, wouldn't let him take slap shots, wouldn't even let him use a curved blade. And many of the minor hockey league teams he played against on the prairies were so overmatched, Wendell often wasn't allowed in over the blue line. So he learned to pick his corners from long range. That and endless hours of practice over the years have given Wendell Clark, and this is news to no one, one of the most lethal wrist shots in the NHL. Wendell Clark, two on one with Gilmore. Clark shoots, scores! And now that he's on the way to a career year and should easily surpass the 37 goals he racked up in his second season, Clark's expectations have been raised along with everyone else's. Well, when I first got here, I basically, uh, the upset was to uh, make the hockey club. That was my only goal. And, and the more you play, the, the higher your goals get and that you want to playing as good a team as possible and right now I think our team is getting to be a better hockey club and that's uh, what uh, your next goal is is to try to win something then of course winning something would be nothing new for Gilmore who played an important role in bringing the Calgary Flames a Stanley Cup in 1989 anchoring the number one line in Toronto means he plays an even bigger role with the Leafs but it's hard to convince him of that we got a bona fide goal scorer Dave Anerchuk uh, we got the uh, heart and soul of the team the captain of the team Wendell Clark um, where that leaves me, I don't know, but um, my now, job. Now, Wendell says it's, it's, it's your job. They're wrapping around you. You're the center of this team, and, and it's up to you to pretty well carry the load. They're more or less the support staff for you. Well, they can say whatever they want, but <laughs> my job is to get the puck to them, and these guys are the finishers. So um, I credit each, and, each guy on my line for all the success and the team success we had last year. And hopefully, I think right at this point in time, we've played well, but I don't think we've played great. And I know personally I haven't, and I've got to pick it up a little more as time is going on and the games are getting harder. Everybody uh, is using us as a, kind of a benchmark of how their season is going to go. Uh, they want to beat us. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it was a tough climb to get to the top, but it's even a tougher climb to stay there because uh, uh, there's no easy games anymore for you. And no easy nights for Gilmore either. It used to be he'd take pride in the checking job he'd do against other star centers in the league. Now it's the other way around. I'm not uh, the fastest guy out there. I'm not the strongest guy out there. So if, uh, if the legs aren't going, my uh, my brain's not working as well. So I've got to be, you know, I think on top of my game as far as uh, physical conditioning. Yeah. And uh, besides that, just use your head and try to stay out of trouble. Of course, it's been well documented that at times by using his head, Gilmore has gotten himself into trouble. But now with Wendell around for on-site policing, that's not the problem it used to be. And while Gilmore has to work harder than ever to get the same results, that's never been a problem. No team has ever been shortchanged by Doug Gilmore. I do have a lot of pride, and if I have a bad night, I know nobody has to tell me. I'll walk out of here, and I wish I could play it over again. So certain nights you're going to be there, certain nights uh, you're not going to be there. But each and every night you got to go out, put the skates on, and go up and down. And... It is hard at times, but again, once you're into the game and a guy hits you once, then uh, you kind of wake up and say, okay, let's get it going. It's almost guaranteed now that Doug Gilmore will never be anything but a Toronto Maple Leaf. In fact, he's become so attached to the city and the team that as part of his new contract, he wanted a couple of seats here behind the bench so that when his career is over, he could always come back and cheer on the boys. The problem is these seats are already taken, and thanks to the Leafs' resurgence, will be for years. In fact, the best they could do for him was a pair way up in the blues. Yes, Dougie Gilmore himself has become a victim of the Maple Leaf monster he helped create. This is Don Martin for Sportsline. Goaltenders. By nature, they are strange, often moody types who are consumed by self-doubt. One bad game, one missed shot, and your career could be over. On the other hand, some goaltenders thrive on pressure. Leaf netminder Felix Potvan falls into the latter category. As Bill Bird tells us, this soft-spoken cat has a knack of making the big save at a crucial point of the game. Miller, cutting in, right in, stop! 
With what we've seen so far, it's hard to believe that Felix Potvin wasn't drafted when first eligible in 89. But the next year, he became the Leafs' second choice and third goaltender taken overall. After another year in junior, Potvin joined the organization and eventually hooked up with Rick Wamsley, who found him an eager student. He's a, a real uh, competitor. He doesn't. He looks real calm and cool on the outside, but inside the fires are really burning. He's, he's a competitive kid. He, he wants to win. He wants to do well. Um, he wants to be a leader on this team, and, and so far everything he's done this year is, is uh, pointing in that direction. Potvin spent just one season in the minors and came within one game of leading the St. John's Maple Leafs to the Calder Cup. He started last season with the Leafs before being returned to St. John's. I guess it was good for me, and last year it was more uh, for confidence. I hadn't played for a, a while, and uh, Grand Fury was playing good, and uh, I just went down there to uh, work hard and uh, hopefully get called up, and uh, Grand get hurt again, and I got lucky, and uh, things uh, turned around uh, good. So good, in fact, the Leafs were able to deal Grant Fuhr to Buffalo for some much-needed goal-scoring help in the person of Dave Anderchuk, with a first-rounder thrown in for good measure. Potvin starred in the Leafs' splendid playoff run that saw them come within one game of the Stanley Cup Final. When the Leafs faltered early in their first series against Detroit, the coach's faith in his young netminder never failed. He showed a lot of confidence in me, and uh, I owe him uh, a lot for this, even last year. And, uh, in the series against Detroit, after those first two games, uh, he uh, came back with me, and uh, that that really put a lot of confidence in me, and I felt really good after this. He's in full control, and uh, you know there's a lot of confidence that is made between, uh, I think, the uh, the guys in front of him uh, that are playing, and the guys in front of him have a lot of confidence in the guys behind him. Felix has been absolutely fearless against enemy shooters, but he was worried this past summer about the fans. His agent, Gilles Lupien, was demanding a new contract for $2 million. Many thought that outrageous, and Felix felt that the fans would take out their displeasure on him. Well, as it turned out, he would sign for a million three, and in view of the fact that Patrick Awah got four million, it appears Cliff Fletcher got himself quite a bargain. This is really Felix's first full year in the National Hockey League, and that in itself is amazing considering his performance on the ice and uh, let's face it he's uh, the cornerstone of the Maple Leaf Foundation and will be for a long time to come. Potvin continues to shine this season. If he has a bad game and it doesn't happen too often he doesn't put two of them back to back. There's no sign of a sophomore jinx. I heard a lot about it and I heard a lot about it too when I was junior and uh, I didn't really think of it and uh, that's what I did this year. I said I'm going to work hard, I'm not even going to think about it and uh, I guess these things can be uh, just in your head maybe and uh, so far it's going good. Despite playing fewer than 100 league and playoff games, Potme is quickly being recognized for his efforts. Latest balloting for the NHL All-Star Game shows Potvin with a comfortable lead for the Western Conference team. And good as he is already, Felix is convinced the best is yet to come. Well, you always gotta, can improve year after year, I guess. And uh, you always have something to learn, and that's what I'm working on right now. And I'm only 22, so uh, hopefully in five or six years, I'll be a lot better. Next on Sportsline, we'll go inside the coach's head. What's Pat Burns really like? Stay with us and find out. It's amazing all the different beers there are these days. Lights, drafts, cold filters, dries. Trends. Yeah, people try them, and they usually come back. Yeah, they come back. There's a lot to be said for a distinctive full-flavored beer, and there's one Molson Ale that says it all. Imagine staying at the beautiful Ramada Resort Parkway in Orlando, Florida. Imagine enjoying it all for as little as $89 per night. And if you stay seven nights or more, you and your guests will receive round-trip airfare certificates at no extra charge. When you buy during the Brick's greatest pre-Christmas sale ever, everything in the store is on sale. And with your minimum purchase of $698 or more, receive two round-trip airfare certificates to Orlando at no extra charge. When you purchase seven nights hotel accommodation, everything's on sale during the greatest pre-Christmas sale ever. On now at the Brick. At TD Bank, 
We have 475 customers named John Smith. They're all different, so we have different services to fit everyone. Because of TD, no matter what your name is, you're never just another John Smith. TD, your bank, your way. It spans the horizon crossing five time zones. The coast-to-coast -coast symbol of friendship between two nations. The world's longest unprotected border. And there is a company that will protect you on either side of this border with 24-hour roadside assistance. Which is why, if you get stuck for any reason at all, we'll be there to help you on your way. Even in the center of Edmonton, Kentucky. The company is General Motors. Poorly fitted insulation leaves gaps in here which can be even worse back here. These gaps reduce our value of the insulation by up to 35%. Flexibat is made to fit perfectly. The exclusive flexible edge compresses and expands for a better fit in here and back here. See? No gaps. New Flexibat, full R value, the better insulation. Welcome back. You heard Cliff Fletcher state this earlier. He was surprised to find Pat Burns available, and there is no question in Cliff's mind that Pat sets the tone for the team's on-ice performance. A huge piece in the Maple Leaf puzzle. Mark explains. Talking to L.A. King players. No, he's not. He's take, talking to Melrose. Look and out. Burns is trying Look to get out. down at Melrose. What you see isn't always what you get. Take, for example, Pat Burns. He may appear to be a loaded stick of dynamite when he's behind the Leaf bench. He may seem consumed by winning even to the point of intimidation. When the game is on, Pat Burns is all business. But sometimes he just wants to be one of the boys, a player's coach. You wouldn't know it from this footage, but the Leafs had lost a heartbreaker the night before against St. Louis. Instead of playing the role of master disciplinarian, Burns took a more lighthearted approach to practice. He's won the Jack Adams Trophy twice in five years as the NHL's top coach. He's won over a new generation of Leaf fans. And he has some very interesting and revealing views on what it's like to be the coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Pat, do you look forward to going to work every day? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm usually in here early, uh, sometimes, uh, except game days. I think uh, uh, practice days, I'm usually the first guy in here. I usually uh, come in and organize what I have to organize for the for the day but uh, I enjoy uh, I enjoy coming in here and uh, always have because uh, you have to do what you what you love and I love the game of hockey do you sleep well at night when we're winning yeah uh, in the playoffs is probably the tough part uh, you don't get much sleep uh, uh, you got bad eating habits you usually gain some weight too because you're, you're eating at all kinds of hours and uh, you're not eating the best of foods, and the sleep is is, is kind of tough. And uh, uh, I think during the regular season, uh, I sleep pretty good, but uh, during the playoffs, it's tough. When did you realize that um, hockey wasn't for you, pro hockey, you weren't good enough to play it, and uh, maybe coaching was a better idea? Well, after my junior career, I think uh, uh, playing junior hockey in, in Hull, Quebec, and um, then realizing that... Uh, uh, there wasn't the opportunities of playing the game like there is today. There wasn't that many clubs. Uh, there wasn't, uh, you know, the the opportunities to play. The, the 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 minor league systems were very old, or the players were older. They were career minor leaguers. So uh, after watching everything and studying everything, I said uh, maybe I should do something else. But I always stayed in the game of hockey, and uh, and that's how I became a police officer. And uh, uh, but stayed in the game. I kept on playing senior hockey and, and, and started coaching uh, minor hockey, and that's how the passion of the game stayed in me. The first year I did coach Major Junior A, uh, that's the year that uh, I had to make a decision. Um, I was working days, and I was coaching general manager in Hull, and um, I would work from 7 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon and then practice from 4 to 6, do my paperwork. So I'd, I'd, I'd probably get... I guess about three or four hours sleep a night, and by Christmas time, I was ready to drop. At what point in the coaching career did um, did you know you had a chance to move on to the next level, to the National Hockey League? 
Well, I, I never really did. When, it, when after that that year that I did both jobs, uh, the decision came down. Wayne Gretzky bought our junior team then in, in Hull, and uh, uh, I thought it was over. I thought he'd bring all his people in, and uh, you know, of course, I didn't know Wayne very good, and he called me and, and asked me if uh, you know if I was going to stay on. I said, look at uh, the bosses back at the police at the cop shops. They gave it to me pretty pretty simple. Uh, you be a coach or you be a cop. You got to make up your mind, and uh, of course, uh, I, I did have to make I had a great career as a police officer but I, I had a chance to move on but I never thought it would be in the NHL I thought maybe I'd be a, a career junior coach or something and doing something I like now if, if I would have been married and had a family well I probably wouldn't have made that decision uh, I was alone at the time and I said uh, you know maybe this the, the, this might be good for me so uh, uh, Wayne convinced me to do it and uh, I left uh, the police force and uh, and I was back in 80, 85, and uh, since then, uh, I never looked back. You look like the kind of a guy who uh, enjoys spending time with himself. Uh, would you consider yourself a loner? Oh, yeah, I'm a loner. I, I'm, uh, I'm definitely a loner type guy. I don't like the crowds. I don't really like the, the publicity and everything. I try to shun it away from and put it on to the players because I feel they're, they're the actors in all this play, and I'm just, a, I guess, a director. And I, I like when they, they get the attention and the credit because they deserve it. Uh, I'm, um, when I'm within myself, I sort of, uh, uh, I am alone even on the road. Uh, I go to my room and watch a movie or something and uh, catch up on the sleep that I do try to miss once in a while, work out and things like that. So uh, in the summertime too, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit of a hermit. I try to go somewhere in the woods somewhere and uh, uh, just uh, recharge the batteries because it's a hard, tough season, a lot of travel and people don't understand that sometimes. Let's talk about respect. Um, you demand it, you usually get it, um, but what about the team and the respect that they have for their opponents? Is that important to you and did you try to instill that into the Toronto Maple Leafs? Never take an opponent lightly, but at the same time, don't rub it in if you're winning. Well, I think I learned that from, uh, from, from my family that uh, always, uh, always respect. Uh, you know, and I think that uh, I don't say I demand respect. Uh, I, I think I, I demand a good work ethic and I, I demand honesty because I think I'm honest with the players. I always have been honest with every player that I've had. Um, I'll, I'll say it like it is and how it is, and I won't go around uh, around the barrel. And I think that's what they want to hear. Um, players sometimes are uh, will hide behind excuses. Uh, I've had that before with a. Uh, sort of shine the thing on me and, and, and blame things on me, but I don't mind that. Um, I think that this world goes around, sometimes you get it, sometimes and sometimes you don't. But uh, uh, I, I think when respecting an opposition, no matter how bad they are or how good they are, the respect of an opposition is very, very important. What's the most enjoyable part of your job? I think just just being uh, part of the team. I I, I want to be part of the team, and I think the guys know that of me that I, that I don't put myself on a, on a different on an upper level where I uh, I demand that I have to walk in front of them or uh, I have to. I I like going back in the bus one once in a while and and trade magazines with them or listening to some music with them. And uh, I know Doug Gilmore and and Bob Rouse and uh, Berg and Gil. We all have interest in Harley Davidson, so we're always trading magazines and talking about motorcycles and uh, Dave Ellis in the boats and I'm in the boats too so I, I like to be part of the team that's that's the most thing I, I like to be I wouldn't want to be a closed the door type coach where the door is closed and nobody can talk to me uh, I think uh, the level that that level is very important to be down to earth with your players and uh, try to understand how they feel you seem to have a special relationship with uh, Doug Gilmore are you two guys similar kindred spirits maybe well, I think life has been a challenge for me uh, every time I've, I've been in uh, the coaching ranks. Uh, uh, from day one I started coaching, nobody gave me a chance in hell coach in Major Junior Hockey. We went to the Memorial Cup final. Um, and then after that I went to the American League and people say, yeah, we'll see how good he is now. And I had to prove myself every year and uh, I think Doug is in the same situation. I like a guy that has to prove himself. You still think you'll be coaching hockey in 20 years? I don't think so. <laughs> I what aspirations not. do you have? <laughs> I think I, I'd like to uh, to coach maybe till I'm about 50 years old, and that's that's getting there <laughs> about eight years, seven, eight years from now, and uh, uh, maybe stay in the end of the game. I don't think a guy can coach all his life. It, it's very tough on on, uh, on oneself, especially if you uh, if you take it to heart as much as I do. If uh, uh, if if winning is a priority to you, it's a lot of pressure, and I think that. Uh, 
By the age of 50, I'd like to do something else. Uh, stay in the game of hockey, though, because this is my number one passion, and uh, maybe help somebody else, maybe to accomplish a career and be lucky as I have. Next, we'll go back to a time when the living was easy and the Leafs were perennial Stanley Cup champs. Come back and relive the glory. In Canada, people respect the winter elements and will dress appropriately, easily adapting to the change of seasons. Winter, where you'll find the clean, crisp taste of Molson Canadian. I love this country. And what beer's all about. Every car maker offers protection to help people survive accidents. One company asked, what could be safer than not having an accident at all? Recently, they developed a new anti-lock brake, specially designed to cost less. So this year, anti-lock brakes aren't just for expensive cars, because this year, they're standard equivalent on 95% of the cars they make. Introducing new Mr. Clean with bleach. I used to clean the sink twice. One product for the grease and bleach for the stain. Now, Mr. Clean with bleach dissolves greasy dirt and bleaches out stains. Watch. A regular cream cleanser can't deal with this stain, and bleach can't handle grease. But Mr. Clean with bleach cleans and bleaches, even disinfects. Cleaner and bleach in one. New Mr. Clean with bleach. Bleaches and cleans to a shine. What's this color called again? Fuchsia. Fuchsia. I love this new shirt. Don't you have one just like that already? Yeah, but it looks dull. And what the heck is this fuzzy stuff? Introducing New Cheer with Advanced Color Guard. Compare New Cheer with a regular detergent. After many washes, a fuzzy film can build up on cotton. Colors look dull. Cheer helps prevent this film, so your colors look newer, longer. Honey, where's my... What's the color called? Fuchsia? This shirt has never looked better. Uh-huh. Can I have a... Mm -mm. New Cheer with Advanced Color Guard. Fuzz goes, color stays. Now with the seal of cotton. Poorly fitted insulation leaves gaps in here, which can be even worse back here. These gaps reduce our value of the insulation by up to 35%. Flexibat is made to fit perfectly. The exclusive flexible edge compresses and expands for a better fit in here and back here. See? No gaps. New Flexibat, full R value, the better insulation. Welcome back to Sportsline. The saying goes something like this, the best defense is a good offense. Or is it the best offense is a good defense? Whatever the case, preventing the other team from scoring is often a thankless job. The offensive stars get the big money and publicity, while the defenders get little glory. Jim Ralph has the story of a rock-solid but largely overlooked Maple Leaf blue line. As far as the Leaf defense go, this could be about as exciting as it gets. Sure, any one of them could score a big goal at the right time on any given night, but for the most part, they all go about their business quietly. Felix Potvin often gets the most credit in low-scoring wins, while the Blue Line squad simply gives the goaltender the opportunity to be the star. I think that's one of the big things. Uh, I, I, I think as individuals, we're very underrated, and we play well as a group. We don't really have the, the Brian Leach or the Ray Bork, but... Uh, you know, we're pretty solid from number one to six. Well, the one thing we try to stress with our defense is don't uh, step outside your limitations. And that's one thing they realize. They're very good defensively, and they get the puck up to the forwards. And that's, you know, the less we play in our own end, the more we're going to play in the opposition's end. So that's one thing we really try to stress. If they get in trouble, they don't have a pass, put it off the glass, get it out in a neutral zone, we'll try and regroup them. It's unusual for a team to be one of the league leaders in goals against without a 100-point man on the blue line. It seems the Leaf rear guards thrive on working as a unit rather than individuals. It's a team effort that uh, is going to do, uh, do the job. And uh, I remember in Montreal, my first year, Chris Shellos was there, and uh, we had one of the best defense, and uh, we got traded, and we still had the best defense. And I think uh, uh, the way we did it is that uh, not just one guy trying to replace Chelios, but uh, like uh, from five or six guys on the ice trying to do uh, their own job and just try to work together. We can all play uh, penalty kill. We all power play. Uh, and we all, uh, you know, take care of our own end. I don't think there's one guy that's real liability out there. And when you have that, you're going to be pretty successful defensively. If the Leaf defense don't get much attention, it seems to be they want to keep it that way. 
Maybe we're a little bit like the referees out there. I mean, the whole idea is you're not supposed to really notice us. And uh, I think, unfortunately, a lot of the people are here to see see goals and see the big hits. But uh, when you do notice a, a defenseman or, or a goaltender for any particular reason, it's usually you notice it because something bad has happened. You know, whether he's got deked out or, or he's done a miscue. One of the reasons the defense doesn't get much notice at times is that they seem to want to give everyone else the credit. It's a lot easier for us this year in the sense that we have forwards coming back and really helping us out in our end. And, and when you got a guy like Cat back there, it's, uh, it's a big plus and confidence builder. So while the Leafs are obviously right now reaping the rewards of a solid blue line core, it's also good news for the future, as Leaf management can now be patient with the likes of Drake Barahowski, who will now be given an opportunity to slowly work their way into the Leaf lineup. Todd Gill is a survivor of four Leaf teams in the 80s, and he recognizes how much easier it is for younger guys to come into the fold now. Well, it certainly is, and, and not only for Drake, but for uh, Pat Burns. He uh, he doesn't have to rush him in. He, he doesn't need that kid to come in and, and pick up the slack uh, of a, a guy that's supposedly been around five or six years. He can ease him in, and as far as Drake, if you talk to him, he's comfortable with that. He uh, When he plays well, he gets more ice time, and that's the way it should be. Oh, it's great. It's uh, the defense are all playing so well uh, that when I do make make a mistake, they they are there to back me up. And if they're not, Felix is there. So uh, the whole team, like I said, it's a whole team effort, and uh, they're helping me out tremendously. Well, I guess that's just what they're there for. I'm Jim Ralph for Sportsline. And so what does all this lead up to? A lot are hoping it's back to the 60s for the Leafs. Four cups in six years. Don Martin recalls a great run. It had been 11 years since the Leafs had won the Stanley Cup when they faced the heavily favored Chicago Blackhawks in the final of 1962, but the Leafs swept the first two games at home. But the Hawks tied the series at Chicago, and when Johnny Bauer was injured before Game 5, it was up to Don Simmons to carry the load. But the Leafs made that academic, exploding for eight goals in Game 5, then went back to Chicago for a tense 2-1 victory. He puts it out in front, Simmons stops, and the game is over! And the Leafs players come boring over the board to congratulate one another. Bobby Hull led the playoffs with eight goals, but George Armstrong had seven himself and claimed the first of his four Stanley Cups from President Clarence Campbell. The 1963 Leafs, featuring Rookie of the Year Kent Douglas and two-time Lady Bing winner Dave Keon, led the league during the regular season and would face Gordie Howe and the Detroit Red Wings in the Stanley Cup Final. And while the Leafs featured a solid core of veterans, Tim Horton, Alan Stanley, Bob Bond, Red Kelly, Billy Harris, Bob Pulford, Frank Mahovlich, it was Dick Duff who sparked Toronto with two goals just over a minute into the series. Over the blue line, closing in, the score! Eddie Litzenberger did almost the same thing to Terry Sachuk in Game 2 and the Leafs headed to Detroit up 2-0 in the series. The Wings salvaged Game 3 at the Olympia, but Toronto won it in 5 with none other than the entertainer scoring the deciding goal. Number 12, a clearing pass in the left wing, stopped by Douglas. He shoots, hits that six, score! A deflective shot by Kent Douglas, hitting Shaq six and going into the corner of the net, and the Leafs take the lead. The Maple Leafs had back-to-back -back Stanley Cups, and the question was, could the same group do it again in 1964? The answer was no. After an infamous 11-0 loss to Boston in mid-season, Punch Imlock shook up the team, trading five veterans, including Duff, Bob Nevin, and Rod Sealing, to the Rangers for Andy Bathgate and Don McKenney. Bathgate racked up 18 points in 15 games in the playoff drive and was a key in the postseason. Of course, 64 is best remembered for Bobby Bond's overtime goal in Game 6 that got the Leafs back on even terms. He comes back to Bob Bond, he shoots, he scores! Bob Bond shot! over Sachuk's shoulder into the corner. And the Bond, later discovered to have broken an ankle, also played game seven and thus inspired the Leafs prevailed on Andy Bathgate's goal. Andy Bathgate picks it up. He's in the clear. Going in alone. Right in on goal. He shoots the score. Toronto claims a third straight Stanley Cup for the second time in the team's history. While the Leafs did not do much except get older in the next two seasons, there would be one more year of glory in 1967, Canada's centennial, and the last time the original six would have the stage to themselves. The Leafs, led by an unlikely hero, Jim Pappen, and his seven playoff goals would beat Montreal in six. And the tension mounts. Stanley moves into Bellable, and Red Kelly gets the puck. 
Kelly sends Pulford away, and there's Armstrong speaking up the right side. A perfect backhand pass to Armstrong. And the Leaf captain hits the empty net. It's all over. It was the last time the Stanley Cup was awarded in Toronto. After the series, Johnny Bauer had the nerve to ask Punch Imlock for a raise. Imlock, who had once called Bauer the greatest athlete in the world, nonetheless turned his goalie down flat, saying he was lucky to have a job in the NHL at his age. Bauer was making $13,000 a year. In some ways, the best of times were also the worst of times. The Ballard era had begun. It was pretty good then for the Leafs, and it's all right now. Thanks for allowing us into your homes. Good night from Sports Line. Good night. It's All Right Now is brought to you by Molson Canadian, what beer's all about. And by General Motors of Canada.